Uh, as usual, I'll um, start the briefing today from Heart for Healthcare uh, regarding the number of patients we are managing uh, across the system. Um, I'm hearing some noise. If you don't mind putting yourself on mute, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So Heart for Healthcare uh, acute facilities are managing 360 patients across the system right now. We have the highest number in Hartford Hospital is 162 patients. Uh, the numbers are stable since yesterday. We had 160 yesterday, it's 162 today. And 59 patients in Hartford Hospital who are PUI. Uh, St. Vincent has 90, St. Vincent Medical Center has 95 patients with uh, 16 PUI. Hospital of Central Connecticut has 42 patients with 22 PUI. Uh, Mid-State Medical Center has 31 patients uh, who are positive and four PUI. 15 at Charlotte Hungerford, who are positive with no PUI at this time. And Behavioral Health, I'm uh, sorry, Bacchus Hospital has 11 patients who are positive and eight PUI. And Wyndham Hospital has four patients who are positive and four PUI. So we have 113 PUI um, and 360 patients who are COVID positive. Our Behavioral Health Network has two patients who are positive and Community Network is managing 139 patients across the home care and other settings. Uh, these are the individuals who are under care and um, 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 yeah, we will, we hope that um, recovery for most um, or all. Uh, Heart for Healthcare so far has cared for more than 1300 patients since we began this COVID journey. Um, and th that's the number as of yesterday. We have 679 patients who have recovered. As I mentioned yesterday, um, we had 374 five patients, uh, 374 um, of our colleagues who have been tested positive across the system. Um, that is in the, put in the context with 30,000 employees um, um, in all sectors of our organization. Um, and for, as we've talked about several times, we started a call center, several, one of the first one, which was 24 seven in, um, in Connecticut. Uh, we've had uh, a tremendous amount of um, calls come through that number uh, till now. Uh, but interestingly enough, we have had 56,000 virtual healthcare visits as well through our medical network um, for the state of Connecticut. And we've got calls from many states actually who are reaching out for virtual health uh, as well. And that uh, process of being able to provide an access to the patients who are concerned about coming to facilities or uh, um, hospitals is a wonderful um, place to be as we've evolved in the system. These virtual visits allows for us to come and connect with the patients who are at home and, and, and concerned in, uh, in whatever the fashion. And these calls have been generally all for COVID and non-COVID related as well. We continue to see growth every single day. Uh, we manage close, close to 2,500 virtual visits every single day across the system. We have a lot more capability. We can handle up to 5,000 calls a day, so we have a lot of capability to be able to do that um, at this time. Um, now, um, this virtual visits and other things which are happening across the system as we have uh, evolved and um, in this journey over the time, we've created a, a very safe environment in the sense of making sure the patients who comes to the hospital are managed differently and triaged differently when there's a suspicion of COVID-19. Uh, and we are seeing some increase in number of patients who are seeking care at the moment who are non-COVID related. And that tells us that the community and the society is looking for some more support at this time. And all the systems, hospitals across the heart for healthcare on our ambulatory services are ready at the moment, especially the medical group, uh, primary care and specialty care to, to accept and to obviously see the patients who are non-COVID related uh, concerns as well. And those uh, measures of safety precautions, reducing the risk of COVID exposure, contact tracing, and many other things are put in, put in place right now so we can safely um, support the need of the community as, um, as it relates to non-COVID uh, related issues as well. Heart for Healthcare also started the e-console. That means across the system, um, as uh, we had anticipated that uh, uh, the need for different type of consoles will go up um, across systems. So we created what we call the e-console. So a patient who is in Charlotte Hungerford requires a, let's say, top-notch neurosurgical consultation on the spot at any given time. Uh, a neurosurgeon in Hartford Hospital can support that piece as well. So we've worked as an integrated system in, in a way to be able to support uh, the need of the community across the state of Connecticut. And our focus has always been to be able to provide the care to the community where we live in to the most capable uh, place we can we can achieve and we've done very well with this process as well so uh, I, I'd like to 
uh, talk about the reassurance to the community as a, as a health healthcare system has um, um, responded to this uh, challenge, or we have created several systems and processes to be able to need uh, to be able to provide the care uh, as it needed um, in all the areas. Well, I had mentioned yesterday we are starting a mobile testing centers, uh, and all everybody can get tested at this time uh, through our clinical command center eight six zero nine seven two one eight zero zero. Uh, we have obviously understood the need for the community and the state to have increased testing, and Heart for Healthcare is partnering with Quest, as you heard last week, to increase the testing capability. And we're going to be opening three different centers pending state's approval um, at Westford, uh, in Westford, um, Westport, uh, Newington, and Mystic area. So the three more access centers will provide for testing um, um, at this time. We are still um, looking to um, stand up our capabilities, uh, and we have um, we have already done a lot of work, and we've already partnered with some businesses and uh, um, other um, uh, non hard for health entities to provide uh, services such as infection prevention um, uh, techniques and um, our capabilities of physicians to reach out virtually, our um, um, our um, uh, process of uh, testing, and many other clinical guidelines as well. So we encourage businesses who are curious, who are looking for some uh, advice. Uh, our system, our, our, our teams of doctors and nurses are ready to support you as well. Uh, we are looking forward to supporting our state's um, businesses as they uh, look for recovery over the next several weeks uh, at this time. Um, uh, I had mentioned yesterday about the N95 reprocessing and decontamination. The process is well underway. Our teams are working with our facility with the Battelle which is state's uh, sub supported system to continue that process. Been well accepted by our teams. The, the quality is good, and I think we have, feel very comfortable. This is a good solution for a long time to come. Um, I think I talked about the peak yeah, and uh, the trends. Uh, a trend has been that um, um, across the Hartford Health Care set setting and across Connecticut, we've seen um, two or three different data points moving in different directions. One is uh, our active cases continue to rise gradually. Um, our hospitalization has seems to have peaked, and we've seen some decline in the last several days uh, across the state of Connecticut. But every region is somewhat different, um, and I think um, uh, the concerns we have, at least I have, about some of the dense areas, such as Fairfield and other areas, that there is an increased concern about how um, um, yeah, the, the, the things might change depending on the density and the, how the social distancing is managed over the time. So we're going to continue to keep an eye on that closely and as we, as, we, as we go in this journey. We've got a few more weeks to go ahead in front of us to really settle down where um, this is going to end. Um, but this is going to be closely watched. With that, I have uh, one of my colleagues, um, Mr. Joseph Paul Haber, who's a clinical pharmacist at St. Vincent Medical Center, who's going to be joining and sharing his uh, perspective in this COVID crisis. So I'm going to pause to Joe. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity and honor working with the providers and nurses taking care of these patients in the ED and in the ICU, as well as some of the ID physicians taking care of these coronavirus patients. You know, pharmacists are considered the drug experts, and we are helping the providers with any recommendations that they need. And when they need to start patients on therapy, we're there to help them you know, making sure that everything is correct, there's no drug interactions, no contraindications, making sure it's safe for the patient. And we've been monitoring all our patients on a daily basis going through, I know for myself, the ICU pharmacists and some of the pharmacy residents have gone through all our coronavirus patients looking at the labs because they change daily, making sure that the therapy that they're on is still accurate. Um, if we see anything that should be changed, we'll reach out to the providers to let them know and they've been really uh, appreciative of what we've been able to help them with. You know, it's a second pair of eyes because these patients are very sick, they're very complex, and we're making sure we're providing the best possible care for these patients. You know, another thing that we've been doing is we've been monitoring how much some of the medications we've been using because we've seen what happened in Italy. A lot of those patients need to be on ventilators. So we, we know that to be on a ventilator, you have to be sedated. So we've been monitoring how much the meds we've been using, in particular our sedative meds, make sure that our patients are still taken care of. You know, we were proactive with coming up with uh, backup plans. We met with the physicians, the pharmacy team did, and we sat down and we came up with 
different backup plans, and we came up with a backup plan to this backup plan. And these plans were just as efficacious as our, our typical myths that we use, but we know that as our coronavirus patients increase in the United States, we know that a bunch of hospitals would need to increase the amount of medications, of the sedative meds that they would be, need to be using for these patients. But we monitor how much we've been using and how much we have on hand. We send this uh, email out to the pharmacy staff and to the physicians to let them know where we stand. So we did have to transition to the, our plan B, which we have not had to do. You know, we were ready for it and making sure that our patients were still taken care of to the best of our ability. Dr. Kumar? Hi. Um, I'll open this um, conference for any questions um, or comments. Looks like we don't have Dr. any. Dr. Kumar, this yeah. is Emily from The Current. Hi, um, I wanted to ask about the mortality rate in Hartford. There seem to have been a lot of deaths in Hartford compared to the number of cases, um, particularly in nursing homes. Do you have any idea why that may be uh, in comparison to the other counties? You know, that's a great question. I think we've been puzzled by that as well. In fact, I did have a conversation with um, uh, some of the colleagues across the state yesterday as well. Um, I think several factors which I think could be playing a uh, part in that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure at the moment that I have a definite answer to that. One is um, um, uh, our nursing homes, um, um, especially um, um, our uh, um, uh, SNF uh, uh, environment at this time, the, the, the way the outbreak has occurred and the way the things have evolved over there, and, and this is at least my understanding, uh, is, uh, is because uh, uh, despite our measures of uh, visitor policy and uh, everything else we've done over there, uh, the, the focus on the contact tracing across the state, uh, we could have done a little bit better or different job, in, in my opinion. I think that could have avoided some of the contact tracing to a certain extent. But at the same time, our nursing home population, uh, that's the most vulnerable population. When the outbreak occurs, um, individuals are uh, more than likely to, um, you know, uh, to, to see a, a difficult course of, uh, um, um, uh, um, of disease, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the comorbidities that uh, the underlying um, conditions on those patients are significant. Um, and I think that's what has led to some of those um, changes. And I'm, um, you know, we all remain concerned about this, and we'll see um, when we come out of the other end of that, how do we dissect this information and uh, how do we plan this going forward in a better way. And when you talk about the, that contact tracing could have been better, um, if contact tracing had been more efficient, do you mean that then the kind of clusters could have been caught earlier? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the contact tracing, as, as, as I've said before, um, there are several components of this uh, fight against the pandemic is about the, the testing. Um, PCR testing is still not widespread in the nursing homes and SNF. And that's one of the reasons Hartford Healthcare is reaching out to a lot of SNFs, and we are planning to test a lot of patients in at least the Hartford Healthcare nursing homes at this time, um, um, and happening actually this week to start rolling out a lot of testing. The component of testing, the contact tracing, um, some of the um, spread happens because the individual who works in one nursing home also works in a different nursing home. Um, or SNF, so that, that mobility of uh, individuals creates some challenges as well. Um, um, to be able, education, the PP um, use, as we've heard a lot about the SNF and assisted living not having uh, enough access to the PPEs as well. There are several components actually have come together, and to a certain extent, and I think as we have, we are trying to put together, uh, we have actually put together, and we're working with some of the SNF and um, nursing homes, to provide education on the infection prevention techniques and processes in a more aggressive way. And as I had mentioned before, the Hartford Healthcare started this conversation with all the state nursing homes back in early late Feb, and we started providing a lot of education at that time. We're gonna to continue to expand that capability as we go forward. So the combination of the testing, combination of contact tracing, com combination of education, and combination of infection prevention techniques, these are the four components that really help managing a nursing home and SNF and assisted living population. Uh, and some of the um, um, uh, you know, ways we, we've been able to contain um, is at least in some of the hard for healthcare facilities because of that. Thank you. Hi, 
Dr. Kumar, Brad Luck from NBC Connecticut. Uh, two quick questions yep. for you. One, um, I saw that the Go Health uh, Urgent Cares will now be able to provide uh, curbside testing. Can you talk a little bit more about that and the push to make testing more accessible? Yeah, we're looking at all areas, uh, whether it's a primary care, uh, Go Health, Urgent Care, um, or our, as I said, SNF, uh, to be able to provide more testing capability. Um, as, as you know, uh, Hartford Healthcare can do uh, more than 2,000 2, tests a day now with the Quest Partnership, which is uh, almost about it. If you think about the close to um, you know, 10 to 12,000 uh, tests we can do in a, in, a, in a week's time, which is a significant uh, boost in number of testing capabilities for the state of Connecticut. So we are making sure our patients who are interacting with urgent care, primary care, hospitals, SNF based, uh, gets the uh, early access. And the areas where the testing is difficult to come by, such as um, 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 you know, pockets of our state where uh, individuals don't have a freedom of mobility in, a, in an easy sense, uh, underserved areas. So reaching out to those, um, those areas as well. So we are gonna continue to expand our testing. And then, Doctor, if you could talk, just you, you touched on it at the beginning, but um, if you wouldn't mind just clarifying as far as how you are viewing where we are in relation to the peak in the state, are we, are we currently at it? Um, it looked like, in my reading of the, the model that you use with MIT, mm -hmm. looks like it could possibly be tomorrow. Um, where are we in relation to the peak in the state? And, and, and also, does, is that anywhere different specifically for Hartford County? Yeah, so um, we, um, my understanding is we are at the peak at the moment, and we are staying at the plateau period of the peak to see how we're gonna trend uh, going forward. Going forward, we're gonna see a trending down of at least a hospitalization. Uh, let me begin with that. Continues to see decrease in the hospitalization of the COVID-related cases. I always indicate the wild card, which is a sniff and assisted living. There's still an area of concern, and that's the, the, we're going to keep an eye on that. Uh, the number of cases in across the Connecticut, and we are going to see two things happening. One, we're going to see, uh, as more testing is rolled out and we do more testing, we're going to see increase in number of cases. So depending on what peak, uh, looking at the hospitalization peak, I think we've already at it right now. Uh, the number of testing, the cases, active cases, we're going to see incline as we roll out more testing. Look, there are some models out there um, looking into, um, if you compare the United Kingdom, United States, or um, countries uh, such as Germany. Um, in Germany, uh, understanding right now is that, that for one positive patient, we know there are three or four more patients out there which we have not tested, which are possibly positive. In the UK, there could be about 25 to 30 patients actually who are still positive we have not tested because testing has not been widespread. In the United States, the number could be five to 10. So that means the number we're looking at right now, if we were to hypothetically test all three and a half million of Connecticut residents, we could see our numbers of positive patients go really high. Now that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing too for us to know who are positive. And if you put the contact tracing in isolation and continue the social distancing policies, and I'm not talking about lockdown, I'm talking about social distancing policy, you know, we could see uh, a different picture of the state. And that's one of the reasons Hartford Healthcare leadership has been quite focused in increasing our effort in the testing side as well. So we could possibly see rise in total active cases as we go forward, because we're gonna test more people. Uh, but that's not a bad thing. That's not something to be panicked or wor worried about. That gives a lot more clarity exactly where we are. What needs to be concerned about the hospitalization rate, because that is the capacity of the system or the state to be able to respond to the patients. And that is our core philosophy. How do we actually take care of the ones who need the care the most? Um, and hospital capacity is something needs to be, a hospital across the state needs to be managed in a way that we can respond. It's a long fight, it's a marathon, and as long as we can sustain the capability of the hospitals across the state and system, we, we're going to, uh, we're going to save more lives. We're going to do a better job over the time. And that's how we look at the models. Thank you. Dr. Kumar, it's Lisa at News 8. Looking at the model, mm -hmm. how did we go from, what are the factors that went into going from roughly 2,000 to 6,000 deaths in Connecticut? Can you talk about that, please? Um, the... That, that's an that's, um, interesting and challenging question because the death uh, period, the mortality period, it follows through um, the number of active cases and especially what kind of population we are seeing. So if you take the nursing home population and SNF population, we have close to 19,500 
uh, individual approximately um, who are in nursing homes across the state of Connecticut. And that is the one we worry about, and the impact on that part here. So the modeling takes care of different factors, uh, different infected rate, and the, the comorbidity and the, the kind of a population we serve in, we have in the state of Connecticut. Um, so I think the time will tell whether it's going to be 6,000 or it's going to be close to 2,000, uh, but it's going to be somewhere in the middle of that, in my opinion. So we will see how it evolves over the time. Any other questions? We have a question on Facebook for Joe um, in terms of the medication supply. Joe, you want to comment or I can take it on if you'd like me to? No, that's okay. I'll comment. Yep. Uh, so the, for the medication supply, we've been doing very well. The wholesalers have been able to supply us with what we need for our, our patients. We haven't had any issues. We were just being proactive uh, to make sure if, and if the wholesaler was not able to supply uh, hospitals across the country with their medications, we were ready. But the wholesalers have been doing a good job with making sure we get in our medications. We haven't had any issues with any of the supply permit. Thank you, Joe. I'll just add on one other comment. As we began our journey in the COVID crisis, in the beginning of the stage, we started analyzing our supply chain effort related to pharmacy, the IV fluids, the supplies, cleaning um, um, uh, disinfectants and PPEs, and, uh, and many other things, which we don't normally think about the food in itself, and you know, how do we make sure that our um, um, you know, uh, teams are supported in a, in a much better way um, um, in, the, in the time of crisis. And our proactivity has been helpful, and we've been able to make sure that supply has uh, obviously met the demand or exceeded the demand um, um, at all given time. I do want to highlight, you know, our, as we think about our response in general, it's not, it's, it's multivariate, and, and we also think about how our colleagues are supported across the system. So when we started the colleague support center, to be able to make sure our teams uh, across the state of, uh, across the state, uh, across the heart for healthcare, throughout the state have access to the childcare, uh, the hotels, the, the groceries, and um, the travel uh, capabilities and all that. So this is a multifactorial response. When we think about how we respond to that, it is also supporting our own people. And, and we think about uh, our manpower capability in a very different way, in the sense that it's just not the physicians, it's the nurses, it's the respiratory therapists, it's the biomedical engineering team members, it's pharmacists. It's our, um, our nutritionists. It's about people who are supplying food to the patients. It's about how we are supporting our colleagues in terms of the travels and their needs, how we think about the manpower capability of some segment of the population is taken out from the workforce because of um, the COVID-related incident, how we respond to that. So it's a, it's a quite complex, but at the same time, uh, multidimensional um, response as we think about. And as we have learned um, to a certain extent, because we had not seen a pandemic in the past, we've learned the integrated system such as Heart for Healthcare, which is spread across Connecticut, can really deliver that, that approach in a very effective way. And as we come out at the peak, we feel very comfortable where we are right now in the sense we, we've got a supply maintained, we've got a manpower maintained, we've got our colleagues supported very well. Uh, we think we are uh, supporting the community as we're needed. We're outreaching to the place uh, where uh, it, it needs to be provided, such as education and ID support, infectious disease support, creating a call center uh, to need, meet the need of the community. So all those factors go into the place to respond to the need of the community. And if you think about the benefit of having a integrated healthcare delivery, what I mean by that is acute hospitals, the post-acute care, the home care services, the nursing homes, assisted livings, our surgical centers, our um, behavioral health centers, our all sorts of varied of factors can help support the community. And that's where the value of a truly integrated system comes into the place. We have another question yep. on Facebook. Do we know if anything is being done to prepare for production of a vaccine in Connecticut when one is approved? It's a great question. Actually, I don't know that. I know um, Jackson Lab had been uh, looking into that, but I haven't really asked this question for a while. So I need to circle back on that. Actually, it's a great question. All right. Dr. Kumar, may I ask about the three testing sites? Can you go over those locations again and tell us when they could be up and running and what kind of testing you'll be doing? Yeah, so that would be in Mystic, Newington, and uh, Westport. Uh, we will detail, we'll send you details about the addresses and everything else later on. Um, uh, they're pending state approval, so I just want to make sure I, I cautiously um, I advise you they're still pending the approval from the state. Um, and the testing will be the PCR testing for nasal swabs and um, for the community as needed. 
Okay? Well, thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow again. Thank you.